welcome you to Pocono International Raceway for the third leg of Auto Racing's Triple Crown, the Domino's Pizza 500. A cloudy and hazy Sunday afternoon, but we welcome you. I'm Bob Jenkins along with IndyCar driver Derek Daly. Well, as we have seen in most cases this year at most tracks, a new track record. Speed is certainly a factor in IndyCar racing this year, but this racetrack seems to gobble up a lot of cars, Derek. It does. We saw from Michigan uh, the last race that attrition is the main factor now. We have record speeds again. We are are expecting a similar attrition race and the race course itself is kind of unique there are three corners and each of them are different they are very different the biggest question all the drivers had was how bad would the bumps be now the worst one they had was turn two they have spent a considerable amount of money fixing that so everybody seems to be reasonably happy 29 cars are set to go in this 500 mile race he should have a busy afternoon in the pit area let's call in our third member of the broadcast crew for this race here's Gary Lee Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon. Well, last year, Michael Andretti made headlines before the race when he was involved in a helicopter crash en route to the racetrack from the family compound. This weekend, he made headlines on Friday by setting the course record, taking the pole at over 205 miles an hour. We have talked about attrition, the high attrition rate at Michigan. This track is very rough. You're very aggressive. So how can you be aggressive but yet pamper the car to make it last for 500 miles? Well, it's really hard to pamper a car here because uh, the other guy's pushing you. You know, you have to run the pace. You have to run with the other guys, so, uh, you know, we'll see what the pace is set at. But, uh, you know, I think you're going to see everybody running flat out. And, uh, like I said, it's hard to pamper a car, but we're going to try if we can. Your dad admits this is the one race he most wants to win. He's never won it. How important is it to you to win in Pennsylvania? Very important. You know, this is our home track. I consider it our home track. And, uh, you know, we're in front of all our hometown fans, and uh, we want to do good for them. And, you know, that makes it very important to us, very special. Weekend's off to a good start. Jeff won yesterday, the American Racing Series. You're on the pole, and Papa Andretti is starting outside the front row, Bob. All right, thank you, Gary. And Johnny Rutherford will be starting between Michael and Father Mario. Well, the Pocono 500 is being brought to you... The command has been given to start engines and 6,000 balloons are being released from the infield as the pace cars and the field pulls out onto the racetrack for this 500-mile race. Now, here is the starting lineup for the Domino's Pizza 500. On the front row, the pole sitter is Michael Andretti. In the Craco STP lean machine, he qualified at 205.724 miles an hour. In the middle of row one, Johnny Rutherford in car number 21, the Vermont American March. Outside of the front row will be Mario Andretti from Nashville with Pennsylvania in the Newman Haas Lola car number five. In row number two will be Bobby Rahal in the Budweiser True Sports March number three. In the middle of row number two, Kevin Kogan in the 7-Eleven March number seven. And outside of row number two will be Rick Mears in the Pennzoil Z7 car number one. The third row consists of number two, the True Value Emerson March driven by Roberto Guerrero. The middle of row number three in the Skoll Unimarts March car number 66 is Ed Pym. Outside of row number three, car number four, the Miller American Special, driven by Danny Sullivan. In the fourth row will be Al Unser in the number 11 Hertz car. In the middle of row number four, Emerson Fittipaldi in number 20. Outside of the fourth row, A.J. Boyd in car number 14. The fifth row consists of Scott Brayton in car number 71 and Dennis Firestone in 36 and Raul Boisel in number 22. The sixth row, car number 55, Jose Le Garza. Middle, Jeff Brabham, car number eight. Outside, number 24, Gary Bettenhausen. In row number seven will be Johnny Parsons in car number 59, Ari Leyendike in 61, and Poncho Carter carrying our in-car camera in car number 15. The eighth row will be Al Unser Jr. in number 30, Dick Simon in 23, and Spike Gelhausen in number 10. The ninth row, Roberto Moreno in number 9, Sammy Swindell in 84, Rocky Moran in 65, and in the tenth row will be number 19, Dale Coyne, and Tom Sneva in car number 33. Tom did not qualify. He was added to the field as a promoter's option. Well, we have a problem with the number 11 machine of Al Unzer. It's still down on pit road, and they apparently have not been able to get that car going, Derek. The first time this well, car raced at uh, Phoenix earlier on this year, yeah, exactly the same thing I happened. They had a spark box problem prior to the start of the race. Now we see a similar thing. Two weeks ago in Michigan, we followed this car quite closely, and it ate, I think, three or four spark boxes. So I think the electrical system on this Chevrolet engine, although the Chevrolet is very, very powerful, they seem to have these small niggling problems all the time. Let's go to Gary Lee. He perhaps can shed more light on this. Gary? Bob, really, I 
can only underscore what Derek has said. Obviously, an ignition problem somewhere in the spark box. The cowling is off that Chevrolet of the defending national champion, Al Unser Sr., as the field roars down the front straightaway on a parade lap. The Penske crew continues to work at the back of this race car. Patiently waiting in the cockpit is Al Unser Sr. Again, ignition, they're not sure exactly where. Fortunately, uh, there will be a couple of more pace laps before the field gets the green, and hopefully Al can get the car started and join the field before the green drops. Well, let's take a look at this very unique two-and-a-half-mile dry oval racetrack. In turn number one, it's banked at 14 degrees. The second corner is banked at 8 degrees. Now, that is the so-called tunnel turn, and the one that there has been a lot of discussion about in the last few years. They have patched it, though, and it's pretty smooth. The third turn is probably the most uh, dangerous. You have to get on the brakes quite hard for turn number three. It's banked at only six degrees. The front stretch is 3,740 feet long. The back stretch, or long pond straight, is 3,055 feet long. And then there is also a north straight that is about 1,780 feet in length. As we indicated, there has been considerable discussion about the roughness of this racetrack. We polled some drivers to get their opinion about that. Uh, they did a new paving section over there, and they've helped turn two out a little bit, but, uh, you know, three and one aren't uh, any better the wear for uh, the winter, that's for sure. It's really unfortunate, and, uh, you know, to see this class of cars running this in this kind of a racetrack, I really uh, don't like the place at all because maintenance hasn't been updated. But it is a rough racetrack, there's no question about that. It's going to be hard on it because of, of the bumps, uh, the roughness of it. You, you, you take a lot of abuse, your body does. It's not going to be one of those races where you can sort of sit back and relax in the straightaways. Many years ago, when the race cars didn't have such a stiff suspension, bumps like we have here at Pocono didn't really make much difference. But now the speeds are so high, and these cars are set up so stiffly, even small bumps are magnified greatly into the car suspension and into the driver. Well, I thought that they had gotten Al Unser Sr.'s car started, but now I'm not so sure. They uh, reached for the cowling to cover the engine, but it still remains off the car as the field comes down for their second pace lap. Next time around, they'll get the green flag, and the thousands of spectators gathered here in the straightaway stand and wave to the drivers, and they wave back as we are about to begin the third and final leg of Auto Rip Racing's Triple Crown. We, of course, will not have a Triple Crown winner this year because we have had different drivers win 500s. Bobby Rahal, of course, of Indianapolis, and Johnny Rutherford at uh, Michigan. Who will win today? Well, time will tell. And there is our in-car camera being carried by Pancho Carter, who's starting back in 21st position outside of row number seven. A very interesting picture from Pancho there. The initial waves were to the people in the grandstands, but then you saw him flex his hand. There you see him just settle his visor. He makes another small adjustment. Sometimes they run with one of the clips open on the visor just to get a nice air flow. Pancho has his left hand on his right shoulder at the moment, adjusting something else. We'll see him as soon as he finishes, he'll take his hand back onto the steering wheel. You see your steering wheel just with one hand at the moment. He's got his adjustment done. He's gone back for a second time. This is exactly what the driver does now on these pace stops. Gets himself comfortable. He still hasn't got two hands on the steering wheel yet, but he will come through this last turn. And good news for the Al Unser fans. They have that Chevrolet engine started, and Al Unser Sr. pulls out of the pit area and will attempt to move into his assigned starting position before we get the green flag. Uh, he should be able to because the field is right now in turn number two and uh, is moving relatively slow. catching up with the field. We may go another lap under caution, or we may start the race with Allens are trying to move up through the field. Now, the 29 starters are in turn number three. The pace car is off of the racetrack. Here comes the field off of the fourth, or the third corner, I should say. And Michael Andretti leads him down, and they get the green flag. The Domino's Pizza 500 is underway from Pocono International Raceway. Just begun the Domino's Pizza 500 from Pocono International Raceway. And as the cars move out of the first corner, it appears as if Mario Andretti has grabbed the lead. Michael Andretti, the pole sitter, is dropping back here at the start of the race. He's 
started this race with a new track record on Friday, qualifying at 205.724 miles an hour. But he is moving up, and now Johnny Rutherford has a lead. We have a crash, a crash in corner number two, as at least two cars are involved. We'll wait for a confirmation on who exactly is involved, but a lot of damage to machinery in turn number two. This is the one that has been so controversial. There is one of the cars involved. That's Johnny Parsons in car number 59, the Schaefer Machinist Union car. And you can see extensive damage to the rear end of that machine, but we can see Johnny moving around in the cockpit. Hopefully, he is all right. The other car involved in the accident is on the inside of the racetrack in the infield, and we have yet to find out who else was involved in this crash besides Johnny Parsons. The second car is, in fact, Dennis Firestone in the Lola, the Raynor Lola. Now, we saw Dennis have an enormous accident prior to the race at uh, the Indianapolis 500. The safety crews are still there. Dennis hasn't got out of the car yet, but he has the best of medical help there attending to him at the moment. But Dennis Firestone in the Raynor Garage Doors Lola is the other car that was involved with, in that incident with Johnny Parsons Jr. And there is, it appears, some concern at this point on Dennis Firestone, Steve Edwards, the car safety director is there and several other medical personnel are on hand let's take another look at it it occurred just as the cars moved through the second corner and a car loses it and does a 360 and Dennis Firestone comes along with no place to go and nails Johnny Parsons Parsons on the left of your screen and uh, Dennis Firestone on the right I think we have a third car in this incident somewhere. It looks as if we might have Scott Brayton also involved in this accident. Now, Johnny Parsons Jr. was involved. I don't think he started this incident. Dennis, Dennis Firestone was unfortunate to be involved because he ran into the car who spun. Now, we think it was Scott Brayton. You're yes, right. indeed, there, there it was. There was Scott Brayton. We don't know what happened to his car. He lost it in the middle of turn two. Now, we don't know whether that was over the bump because he did have problems over the bumps earlier on. But Scott Brayton definitely was the cause of the incident that we're seeing now and which has caused this yellow caution period. And you can see Johnny Parsons and Scott Brayton out of their machines, but there is some concern at this moment about Dennis Firestone. And, of course, we will update you uh, throughout the afternoon. Now, we will have this race at 5.30 Eastern Time here on ESPN. In the meanwhile, we, of course, have Winston Cup racing for you from Michigan International Speedway and uh, some exciting racing throughout this weekend here on ESPN. Earlier today, the uh, Formula One race was won by Alain Pro. So now we take you back for more of the Champion Spark Plug 400 from Michigan International Speedway. Inside the Poncho Carter machine as the field is slowed under yellow because of an accident out in corner number two on the very first lap involving Scott Brayton, Johnny Parsons, and Dennis Firestone. Very good shot of the in-car camera here. You see Pancha doesn't have a hold of the steering wheel very tightly. He's got his hand um, loosely on the wheel. This is for relaxation for the driver because through these very high-speed turns, it's physically very difficult to constantly hold that steering wheel and turn it through these corners. So Pancho is in a very relaxed position here. Now he's taking his left hand away. He's either got it down in the cockpit or he's making maybe a small adjustment to his seat belts. During these yellow caution periods, of course driver comfort is what the driver thinks about so he will make any small adjustments that he can make to his seat belts or maybe his helmet or whatever he can so Pancho Carter in a very re relaxed atmosphere there at the moment during this yellow light period well it was an interesting start because Michael Andretti dropped all the way back to sixth position at the drop of the green flag Johnny Rutherford led lap number one followed by Kevin Kogan third position was Mario Andretti fourth was Bobby Rahal fifth Rick Mears, and sixth was Michael Andretti as Pancho Carter moves through the accident scene. You see a tremendous number of safety vehicles there at the scene of the crash. All three drivers apparently are okay, but they will be moved to the inside infield medical facility where they will be checked over. But first report is all drivers are okay, but a lot of machinery has been bent here in this first lap accident. There are the top five with three laps to go. We'll be back with more from Pocono right after this.
at Pocono where Johnny Rutherford is the leader of this race. One of those involved in the first lap crash out in turn number two, Scott Brayton. He's with our Gary Lee. Kind of a start that we have, and was the start responsible for the altercation on the backside? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do know that the yellow light was still on down at one, but, uh, you know, we went through... Uh, one there and everybody went through good and the car was working well and when everybody accelerated going down into uh, uh, two and I got down on the low side because the high side started backing out like somebody had lifted so I went down low and and was moved down to the inside of the track and I got down on the on the new patch area where I had run several times and really didn't see any problem and when I got down there just all at once it uh, just got loose and next thing I know I was you know around backwards and then of course it hit the wall and Unfortunately, Firestone got into me and so made a mess. It really doesn't answer the question as to whether the start was responsible for somebody backing off up in front. Well, I don't know. I don't know why. You know, I know somebody lifted, but I don't know why or, you know, what. Maybe their car wasn't working quite right. I think the green was on. I'm sure in a, in turn, going into turn two, the green was on, I know. And so everybody was racing and got in there and got loose. All three of you drivers ride back in the ambulance together. Any conversation? No, nothing other than, uh, you know, it's too bad. Stuff we can't talk about on television. Well, no, it, you know, uh, the Livingwell car was running super. Hemel Gun Racing did a fantastic job preparing the car. We ran strong all weekend, and I really thought that, uh, you know, this was our day, but it's not to be. Once again, all three drivers are okay. All right, thank you, Gary. Some good racing going on out there on the racetrack. Bobby Rahal and Rick Mears are running right together on the racetrack, and that's Danny Sullivan right behind them, making it a three-car duel. We have had a change in second place as Mario Andretti has passed Kevin Kogan, and now Andretti is in second. It looks to me as if Ray Hall is slowing down Rick Mears just a little bit. That, in turn, is allowing uh, Danny Sullivan to join the three-way battle. And Roberto Guerrero comes in for a pit stop, and I can see some uh, smoke coming from the rear end of that car. This could be something other than a routine pit stop, although we're expecting pit stop somewhere around the 25th to the 30th lap, and we are now on lap number 24. And another thing we haven't mentioned is that for the first time on a super speedway, radial tires are being used, so we will watch to see how good the tire wear is here on this racetrack. All the drivers seem to be universal in their liking of these new Goodyear radials. The only thing that seems to be common to every car is they say the tires are very hard. They feel very hard, and a lot of the bumps and vibrations come right through the suspension into the car and into the driver. So the radial tires are very, very feeling. This is the battle for fourth position. Bobby Ray Hall and Rick Mears going at it. But in third place is Kevin Kogan. Second is Mario Andretti. And we have a yellow flag being displayed. The yellow is out. And in corner number one, we have Ed Pym. Ed Pym has made contact. He, um, having difficulty getting out of that car. He is pulling himself out now. You can see the right front suspension. He has slid right up into the wall. That right front suspension is well torn off the car. Um, you see Ed walking slowly away. He does seem to be fine. We're not sure exactly what happened yet, but Ed Pym, his day is over. So Ed Pym brought out our second caution flag because his car was moving very slowly and stalling on the racetrack. And now, he brings out our third caution because of some contact out in corner number one. And pit stops are being made here. Kevin Kogan was in and out quickly, and Kevin, I believe, is going to be the leader of the race. Johnny Rutherford, meanwhile, is just now coming into the pit area as the safety trucks are out on the racetrack. And Al Unser Sr. has also climbed out of his race car. And Derek, it appears as if uh, he may have had some kind of contact also. That front suspension looks damaged. It does look a little bit damaged as we watch Rutherford here, um, our early leader, make a quick pit stop. He's making, he's changing two tires. He's topped it up with fuel. And now we come back to our in-car camera with Pancho Carter. Pa Okay, Pancho Carter has actually just got his pit board to say come in for fuel, so he is on his way in this time. So let's follow him down as he comes out of the groove and slows down and gets in for this pit stop. We're going to watch it from right from the in-car camera. This is exactly what the driver sees. He now enters pit road. He's going to watch on the right-hand side to pick out his particular pit board because everything looks the same. He now lines it up. You'll see his mechanics with his tires are lined up waiting for him. 
He stops. He's going to look around. He opens up his visor, gets a little bit of air. He's only taken on fuel. He hasn't jacked the car off, so he's happy with his tire situation at the moment. You see, he makes the little adjustments to his visor. He's probably in communication now with his crew chief. The final check, and away he goes. You see the splash of water? That's the, wa the water they throw on the methanol to dilute the methanol as soon as they pull the hose out of the car. So that little bit of water is no problem for Pancho. He, he will expect it, and it'll clear off our camera lens as soon as he gets about 100 miles an hour, which he will easily get down here. And that is how a pit stop looks from the cockpit of an Indy car. Pancho beginning to build up speed now as he stays below the yellow line in turn number one. We'll catch up with the rest of the field. The number 18 car of Michael Andretti is being shown as the leader. He is the car that is immediately behind the pace car. So we're cleaning up some uh, debris on the racetrack and getting two cars off of the racetrack. Those two cars belonging to Ed Pym and Al Unser Sr. We'll be back with more from the Domino's Pizza 500 at Pocono right after these messages. Indy cars. The we're still under caution at Pocono because of an incident involving Ed Pym and also Al Unser Sr.'s stalled car. Michael Andretti is the leader of this race and we'll try to uh, contact him on the radio. Michael, this is Derek Daly up here in the ESPN booth. You seem to be having problems staying ahead of the group. Are you having a handling problem with the car? from Michael Andretti, at least partially. We're having a little bit of breakup on the radio, but apparently they have made some handling uh, changes, and they may or may not be working. It's extremely difficult for a driver to, to do this talkback situation, so we're trying to catch Michael when he's on the front straightaway here. But we did catch that he has made adjustments before the race started, and they haven't been quite right yet, so he may, he may make some more adjustments during his first pit stop. Our computer scoring shows that Michael Andretti is lapped down and running in 14th position, but we do not believe that to be the case. We believe that Michael Andretti is indeed the leader. As you can see, the safety vehicle still out on the racetrack. Michael just passed by in one of the ambulances. accidents, but to this point, no driver has been injured. So with Michael Andretti leading and the field still under yellow, ESPN and Championship Auto Racing teams present a track fact. The Mars chassis has been very much the dominant car in this year's IndyCar racing, but I'd like to show you one of the interesting design aspects that they have incorporated in their car. Now, for the 86 season, the rule makers reduced the all-important side pod area of the cars to reduce the downforce and curtail the speeds. And what Marx did is they took the exhaust system out of the turbocharger, and instead of having it in free air as normal, they brought it down through the chassis, down right into the tunnel area. So now when the engine is at full song, it actually accelerates the air through the tunnel, possibly giving more downforce, and maybe this is the reason why the March has a little advantage over the, over the rest of its rivals this season. With 29 laps completed at Pocono International Raceway, Michael Andretti is the leader of the race. We'll be back with more in just a moment. We are back at Pocono International Raceway for the Domino's Pizza 500 for Indy cars, and Rick Mears is coming in for his second stop of the afternoon. The clock is on him. The track is green, so they'll be trying to make this as fast a stop as possible, but they're having a little bit of difficulty on the right rear of the car. Now they get it on, and the other rear tire also just a little bit difficult getting on. It's a 20.4 second pit stop for Rick Mears. He was the leader of the race when he came in, and now the leader is Mario Andretti, but we expect Mario to be in in just a few laps. Bit of a surprise that Mario runs so strongly. Um, I say a surprise because of the the Lola uh, up to date on the Super Speedways, but it's, it's, it's good to see that Lola are coming back, making changes, and making this car run a lot better, because it's becoming a bit of a marked steamroller um, up to this point. Kevin 
Jason Kogan comes in for a stop. He was in third position. 7-Eleven crew being led by Cole Selda, going to work on that 7-Eleven Patrick racing machine. The fuel being put into the car. All the tires are changed. Just waiting for the fuel to be completely put in, and there he goes, Kevin Kogan, back out on the racetrack. And Pancho Carter is also in, in car number 15. You see the right front man has changed the right front tire. He now stands. He's the man who tells Pancho to go, and now everything's finished. He gives him the signal, and away they go. Having a little bit of trouble to get this car off the line here. Sometimes the engine, when the engine runs very, very hot, it's difficult to clean it out. So that just goes to show you the all-important pit strategy. The pit people must be just as attuned to what's going on at the driveway. Word now is that Mario Andretti is the leader of this race and not Danny Sullivan. Sullivan shown in second position, about three seconds behind. I don't think Mario has pitted yet, has he? I did not see him do so, neither has Sullivan. But uh, Rick Mears has. Now here comes Tom Sneva pit stop. Tom running in third position unofficially. There goes Bobby Rahal. Now here is Mario Andretti, the leader of the race. See if he chooses to come in this time. He does not. 60, make that 80 laps, have been completed. Remember, Mario has never won here in Poker. The one he dearly wants to win. To follow in his son Jeff's footsteps to won the ARS race yesterday. So Mario Andretti will be very conscious of the attrition rate in Michigan, and in fact, he had a big crash in Michigan, so he will be very conscious of just going fast enough, but not too fast to break that car. The end of 
of 80 laps, the average speed was 132.806 miles an hour. So they're considerably off the track record because of the numerous yellows that we have had. But we have been green now for the last several laps. There is Mario going inside and lapping his son Michael. And Michael's day certainly has not turned out as well as he hoped it would. Pole sitter, who uh, had trouble at the start of the race. He backed off, seeing the yellow light still on in the first turn. And then the handling went away on the race car. And he is two laps down, running in 10th position, according to our timing and scoring information. He has also now put a lap on Jose Lee Garza, who was managing to stay on the lead lap for a long time. But now Garza is also a lap down. Well, it's a very, very big weekend of auto racing here on ESPN and nationwide. Before this race, this afternoon, it was a very interesting uh, wives race. And I don't know whether you saw that or not, Derek, but that was a lot of fun. These gals were uh, bumping and banging out there. They raced in uh, little go-karts here on the main straightaway, and Jeff Brabham's wife won it. Katie Guerrero finished in second position at the Formula One race earlier today in Austria. Here comes Mario in for his pit stop. The winner in Austria in the Formula One race was Alain Prost with... Oh, and Mario missed missed his pit area and almost ran over one of his crew members. But at the last moment, the crew member jumped out of the way. Mario is going to have to go another lap, but this is going to cost him dearly. The reason he has to go another lap is because he's not allowed reverse in the pit lane. Now, you'll see what happens here. He's in the lead. He comes in just a little bit too fast. He now moves out of the hot, hot groove. He's pulling into his pit lane. Now he's already knows he's too fast. He's got the left wheels locked up. Now he's got the right front locked up. He's missed it. He knows he's missed it. He turns right and goes around another lap. The reason he's not allowed reverse on the pit lane. So as soon as he misses it, he has to go around again, do another lap. You see he's got the left front brake locked. That crew member was very, very lucky to get out of the way just in time. Well, we talked earlier, Derek, about how difficult it is to find your pit area when you're coming down here at such fast speeds, and that certainly was graphic uh, display of that. He's going to try it again. Mario Andretti making a pit stop. And this time he comes in safely and stops the car right on the marks. We saw earlier on how three or four seconds cost Rick Muir the a place on the, gr on the, uh, the track. Well, this will definitely cost Mario Andretti his lead position. The crew still working, changing the tires, getting the fuel in. The work is completed, and Mario smokes the wheels and tears out of the pit area in 18 and a half seconds. There is the race for the lead between Bobby Rahal and Rick Mears. They're going down the long pond straightaway, and they're separated by only about four or five car lengths. Bobby Rahal from Dublin, Ohio, the winner of the Indianapolis 500, leads the Pocono 500. We'll have to see how Mario and Freddy can catch up to this lead point now, but I feel he's probably going to be at least half a lap behind. And trying to catch two people as strong as these two guys are running at the moment is going to be very, very difficult. Not an easy assignment at all. Rick Mears looking strong here. He dives inside. Coming down the straightaway at the start-finish line. He cannot make the move, and Bobby Rahal holds on to the lead. You can see how rough that racetrack is there in the uh, straightaway, and Mears goes to the high side and passes Rahal. He couldn't get the job done on the inside coming down the straightaway. He waited until he got into the corner, then went high and passed Rahal, and now is really stretching out the lead. That's the most surprising move. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that, to come inside somebody at such high speed, realize they can't make it, and they go down the outside. You see again. Rick try to go inside first. Rayho took the line, so Rick said, hey, I'll go around the outside. <laughs> and the car looked like bottomed out there in the first turn. Several of them, several of the cars have been doing that in practice and in qualifying. And Mears now has the lead and the advantage that he has over Bobby Rahal in just this. Oh, and Rahal is into the pits. So Rahal will not be second. Danny Sullivan goes into second position. Rahal is in the pits. I think that explains to us what we just saw because a man of Rahal's um, ability with his car and himself doesn't let things like that happen. For Rahal to come in immediately after something like that happens, I can, think he, I can only think he must have a handling problem. Steve Warren and the other members of the Budweiser crew are looking things over, but they send Bobby back out there. A very risky move for Rick because, as we could see, the back of the car began to bottom out and hit the ground. When you change lines in a corner like turn one, there's a severe bump just as you turn in, and Rick hits out of the wrong point on the wrong line. That could have put him into problems very, very easily. 
Bobby Ray Hall back out of the track, building up speed, but Rick Mears is the leader now, and it's a three-second advantage over Danny Sullivan. Mario is third, Kevin Kogan is in fourth position, and Bobby Ray Hall has dropped to fifth. The only other two cars on the lead lap are Tom Sneva in sixth and Poncho Carter in seventh. There is Danny Sullivan in the number four car, running in second position at the moment. Another thing I noticed on Ray Hall's pit stop was when the mechanic told him to leave, he said no. He pointed to something in front of his car, and until they cleared that away, he wouldn't leave. Now, what that was was the air hose. If Ray Hall had run over that air hose, he would have got a stop-and-go penalty just like Moreno did. So Ray Hall saw the problem, got it corrected before he left the pit lane. Now Rick Mears moves to the outside and tries to put a lap on. I believe that's Poncho Carter with our in-car camera. And if he passes Poncho, it will put Poncho a lap down and mean that only six cars are on the lead lap. There is Poncho going down the long pond straightaway. We'll look to see if Rick Mears appears from the left side of the screen, we assume. They go down into the second corner. Poncho brings the car high out of the corner against the uh, outside boilerplate plate wall. And we see no evidence of Rick Mears at the moment. He may wait until the straightaway here to make his move. Poncho brings the car through corner number three now. Still say, staying on the lead lap. And Rick is right behind him, pulling to the inside at the end of the straightaway. But there he goes. Right at the end of the straightaway going into turn number one. Mears passes and puts Poncho a lap down. Six cars now on the lead lap. an update on the pop-off valve situation that he talked about earlier involving Rick Mears. Well, I found it most unusual when I heard that there might be a change to the pop-off valve, so we got the cart rule book. Here it is on page 33. It reads, the valve selected will be used throughout the entire event. It's illegal to change the valve. So why did Roger Penske talk a cart official into bringing one down? And in fact, the cart official did. We showed you to it earlier. We're still trying to sort it out. <laughs> Good luck there. Good work, I should say, Gary, on checking the rule book and finding out exactly what the situation is. Not quite halfway through this race, Rick Mears just passed Allenzer Jr. again, so Allenzer Jr. goes two laps down. Mears setting the pace. Second and a half advantage on Danny Sullivan. Mears told us before the race that he would try and get into the lead and then back off just enough He backed off a little bit, but lost too much of the pace, so he had to go flat out and, and of course, blew his car. And that was the reason he thinks the attrition rate was so high. So he wants to just run this not quite flat out, just a little bit back, control the pace, save his car, but it depends on what everybody else around him is doing. And at the moment, the second place man is Danny Sullivan, his own teammate, so he can give him a little bit of protection. But the man they will watch will be Mario, who's currently in third place, 15 seconds behind because of what we saw earlier on when he missed his pit. Rick Mears going into this weekend was second on the all-time 200 mile an hour plus qualifying runs. Tom Stephen had more than any other driver, but Rick tied Tom this weekend because Sneva qualified over 200 and rather a Mears qualified over 200 and Sneva did not qualify at all. So Mears and Sneva are now tied with the most qualification runs in excess of 200 miles an hour. We are at Pocono International Raceway for the Domino's Pizza 500. Right now, Rick Mears is the leader. We'll be back after these messages. Just past the halfway mark in our Napa mid-race recap shows the leader at the halfway point, Rick Mears. He has led 26 laps. The margin is 15.6 seconds over Mario Andretti. Took an hour, 46 minutes, and 55 seconds to run the first half, and Mears has led the most laps with 32. The average speed of the race, 140.277 miles an hour. Five caution periods for a total of 25 laps. Five cars have led this race, and there are 16 machines still in the event. Cars
cars out of the race include Dennis Firestone, Johnny Parsons, and Scott Brayton in the first uh, lap second turn accident. Ed Pym in a crash that broke his right forearm. Dale Coyne, Dick Simon, and Allen's are senior also out. Rutherford, Gelhausen, Moran, Guerrero, Fittipaldi, and Leyendijk have also called it quits. Now Rick Mears comes in for a stop. His teammate Danny Sullivan is still in the pits right ahead of him as work continues on that car. This is a routine stop at the 103 lap mark. Rick Mears having the tires replaced on the car and fuel put in. He sits patiently. Now the car is down off the jack, so away he goes. Good stop. So a mechanic, one of the mechanics fall over and they try to push the rear wing just to help Rick get out of that pit lane. We also saw the mechanic on the right front make a small adjustment to the front wing, so Rick is not 100% happy with the handling of that car because they have made a front wing adjustment, possibly to give him more downforce. He's going to lose the lead, and he's going to lose it too. Both Mario Andretti, who is still out there on the track, having not pitted. There he is. And also Kevin Kogan beat uh, Rick Mears out of the uh, pit, so Kogan will be in second position. There comes Mario off the third turn, still staying out there, being shown as the leader of the race. Be a very good day, not just for Mario and Betty, but also for Carl Haas if his car could win this event because today at the Austrian Grand Prix, his two Formula One cars won their first world championship points with Alan Jones finishing fourth and Patrick Tombe finishing fifth. So a good day so far for Carl Haas. There is Danny Sullivan who waits very impatiently for work to be completed on his race car. Let's go down to Gary Lee. You can see one of the car officials now sweeping some water away. The problem was a radiator hose and clamp. He was losing water from the radiator. He saw the heat gauge going up in the car, so he brought it in. They have changed the hose and the clamp. They started to fire the car, then they cut the ignition again. We're not sure what the uh, second problem could be. The concern is to get Danny back in the race for points. He is in the championship points chase. So even though he may end up three or four, five, even ten laps down, with the high attrition rate we can anticipate here today, Whoops. it's wise to spend as much time as possible to get Danny back in the competition. Here he comes, though, Gary. He's climbing out of the car. Okay. They're going to try to fix it, even though he's get climbing out of the race car. The crew will continue to work. So Danny has the helmet on. Maybe we can get a word with Danny over here. with uh, Danny Sullivan at the moment. Dan, the vice president of Penske, and uh, handles all the media relations very, very well for the Penske Corporation. Always very cooperative. Back down here, here we are, Gary. Go right ahead. Well, he's taking the helmet off, which is a surprise. Even though the crew continues to work, the helmet is off. The balaclava comes off. And again, uh, in your own words, Danny, what was the problem? Well, it appears that there's um, where the water pump bolted to the block. Uh, it's leaking out of there, and it just dumped all the water out. So trying to fix it there's you know like michigan there's not that many cars left i think there's 16 in here at the 100 you know at the halfway point and if they can get it fixed in about 15 minutes we'll go back out how are the racing conditions i thought they were pretty good but i don't know what happened to jr uh, got a know. tire apparently well that's what they say but i, I don't know you know until we investigate it uh, but i thought they were okay you know you just had to be careful it wasn't the best out there but it's not the worst either problem with the start of the race some drivers apparently thought the green was out some thought the yellow was still out well the problem was when we got down to turn one for the leading pack anyway first sort of six seven cars the yellow was still on so we all kind of backed off and when we came out of turn one the first light just at the exit of turn one was green so everybody took off again and uh, i don't know if that caused the incident in the back because that first I don't know if that was a result of that. An unusual mid-race break for Danny Sullivan. They're still working on the car. Well, it is wise for him to stay out there, though, because, as he said, with only 16 cars uh, left in the race, and that 16th car now 12 laps down, Danny could still gain some valuable points should he get that car repaired and back in the event. We're watching Tom Sneeve out here, the green car, in the extreme left side of your picture. He is running in third position, about 38 seconds behind the leader, Mario Andretti. He was involved with uh, a battle involving uh, Bobby Rahal just a couple of laps ago, but now Tom has pulled away from Rahal. Rahal is in fourth. A very, very good show by Sneva because
because he did start dead last. Smeva had no qualifying time in this car because of a crash he had when he tried to take make his first attempt in his spare car. So a very, very good attempt by Smeva to be running as high as this. And here we have Mario and Andretti still at the head of the pack, still running very, very comfortably with a 23.3 second lead over Rick Mears, who's currently in second position. Mario's best finish here at Pocono was in 1977. He finished second, but as we have said, he has never won here at the track that he considers his home racetrack, his home of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, just about an hour away from here. As you can see, we've completed 110 laps with 90 yet to go. Mario Andretti, the leader, and in second position is Rick Mears, back with more from the Domino's Pizza 500 after this work. International Raceway in Long Pond, Pennsylvania for the running of the Domino's Pizza IndyCar 500. 124 laps have been completed. The leader is Rick Mears with a 14 and a half second lead on Mario Andretti. Those two cars, the only ones on the lead lap. Third, a lap down is Kevin Kogan. Fourth, a lap down is Bobby Rahal. And fifth is Pancho Carter. Sixth, two lap down, Jose Legarza. Seventh, three laps down is Michael Andretti. Eighth, also three laps down, Raul Boisset. Ninth, A.J. Foyt, three laps down. And tenth is Allenzer Jr., who is three laps down. The other cars in the race include Roberto Moreno at number nine, Gary Bettenhausen, also Jeff Brabham still in the race, and so is Sammy Swindell. The most recent retiree was uh, Tom Sneva in car number 33. They need to call Rick Mears. Ooh. Rick Mears needs to be called in because that wing, that wing is going to come away. We're let's go down to Gary Lee, who's down in the Penske pit and has more on this story. Well, Derek, we have checked with the crew. First of all, they said no, Rick has not mentioned that it's a problem. However, a card observer said yes, it is wobbling. Please have it checked when he makes a stop. They are preparing now for a pit stop. They will check and perhaps either tighten or replace that wing. The Penske crew is ready here in the pit area for Rick Mears. All right, now, Derek, first-hand knowledge. What would happen to the car if that rear wing should come flying off? That will send Rick Mears straight into the wall. If All right, I'm here, I'm here with uh, If it happens going into any of these three turns, I think they will replace this wing as soon as he stops. They'll have to. That is scary. It really is. That wing is just flopping back and forth. It appears to be ready to come off at any moment. Let's see if the black flag is given to Rick. I believe they did. And that is only for his own good because we certainly would hate to see that wing come off and Rick involved in an accident. It could be just the fact that the, the track is excessively rough, but nobody else's wing is that loose and flopping around that much. So we'll see if Mears now heaves that black flag and comes in for a stop. I think he will because he's too professional not to, and I think it's going to take them at least at least a lot longer than the 14-second lead he has over Mario and to fix this problem. So I think at this pit stop, we're going to have Mario fight comfortably in the lead after this stop. Okay, Rick is slowing down, and he's coming into the pits. We'll give, uh, throw it down to Gary Lee, who's there in the Pitsky pit and can describe what's going on. Gary? Well, we are here, and here is car number one, Rick Mears. They go to work refueling it, going to work on that wing as we move to a better vantage point here. They have a spare ring ready to go on, so they are not going to tighten this one. Apparently, they're going to try to take it off. Now they say cut the engine. There is a sign to cut the engine. They drop the car off the pneumatic jacks. Some bit of unorganization here on the part of the Penske crew, which is very, very unlike the Penske organization. Now they have the car back up on the jacks, and all the crew has now moved to the back of the pack to try to take that wing off. Now, Derek, a question. We observed that lap after lap. Why couldn't Rick feel it? Because, Gary, as long as the wing is still on, it will still maintain probably 95, almost 100% of its downforce. It's only when it suddenly snaps and changes direction that he would feel it. So it hadn't really got to that point. The little wavering that we could see, Rick, I can understand how he wouldn't feel it. We are being told now that the mount broke. I would assume uh, an educated guess would be because of the roughness of the racing circuit here, a broken mount on the rear wing. They are changing that right now as Rick stays in the cockpit, the car up on jacks. They've topped off the fuel, so as soon as they get this wing changed, Rick is ready to go back out. You can almost 
almost see the anguish on Rick Mears' face. He pounded the fists against the steering wheel a couple of minutes ago. All you can do is sit there. There he shakes his head, just not able to understand how such a thing can happen when the car is working so well and when you've got a comfortable lead and apparently the field covered. But such things happen in racing, and this has put Rick almost to the point now of not in a position to win this 500-mile race. One of the things we mentioned earlier on was how rough these new radial tires you make the feel for the driver in the car. Every bump is absorbed right through the car, through the driver. And this, they felt, was, was one of the reasons why it would break the cars. And earlier on, when we saw Tom Sneva talk to Gary Lee, he had the rear jack in his hand. That literally broke and fell off the car. And I think it's probably down, definitely down to the bumps on the surface that, that actually physically breaking these cars here today. Well, with Rick Mears in the pits, Mario Andretti is the leader, but there are now three cars on the lead lap. With uh, Andretti is Kevin Kogan and Bobby Rahal. The work continues on the Rick Mears machine. They're trying to replace the rear wing on that car. and they get that out, how difficult will it be to start this hot engine? This can often be a problem, Gary, because what happens is there's so much heat in there, the fuel will vaporize. The fuel actually vaporizes before it gets down into the cylinders. So don't be surprised if they do have a lot of trouble trying to fire this car up. We did see a slight fire again from the turbocharger area. They have a uh, spray unit down there, a water line. They have the wing now off from the bottom strut. The rear of the gearbox, so a major, major pit stop. But once again, it's a matter of getting back out with the high attrition right here. Rick could still get some championship points. Gary, Gary you may be able to see. Uh, it's, 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 I find it a surprise that they didn't just unbolt the wing. It must be the gearbox is broken. It must have broken the wing out of the rear of the gearbox. Maybe you can get a little bit closer and uh, see where the actual broken mounting is. I think it must be on the gearbox. Well, they were saying just the mounting so they did not specify Dan Luganbuehl is standing right here next to me Dan can you tell me exactly where the brake was it appears we developed a crack in the mount Gary at the base of the wing and that's what we're gonna have to replace on a car all right so there it is Derek apparently at the base of the mount and that's why the entire assembly came off well Rick won here last year um, that maintained his winning streak of a win every year that he's been in competition in Indy cars but I'm afraid the token of 500 this year is not going to extend Rick's winning streak for this year. He's going to have to wait for another race. So there's no way from now on that he's going to be competitive. But we could have an interesting situation if Mario Andretti continues to hang on the lead and win this race. It'll be his first ever win at Pocono International Raceway. The pace of the race is picking up 148.030. The average speed at the end of 130 laps as Pancho Carter comes in for another pit stop. And Kevin Kogan is also in. Kogan was running second. We have been green since lap 55. So we got off to a rather shaky start with several accidents. But we have been green since lap number 55. And we are currently on lap 134. Kevin Kogan's crew works on his car. Gets it refueled and the tires changed. Kogan goes back out onto the racetrack. Kogan, Kogan is still now very much in the hunt. Before that stop, he was 45 seconds behind Andretti, and now his crew will have informed him that Rick is effectively out of the race. So this really is a new lease of life for Kevin as regards trying to win this race. Well, Rick Mears has been in the pit area for six laps. He is currently down to 10th position, six laps down to the leader. We'll be back with more from the Domino's Pizza 500. With Derek Daly and Gary Lee, this is Bob Jenkins at Pocono International Raceway on a Sunday afternoon, the running of the Domino's Pizza 500. Mario Andretti is the leader. He gained the lead after Rick Mears came into the pits to replace a broken mount on his rear wing. And you can see that uh, he'll be carrying a wing that has Miller on it, right, Gary? Well, that is indeed the situation. The backup wing here had the mount, but did not have 
actually mounts to the engine itself. So consequently, they went back to the garage area and took a backup wing off of one of Danny Sullivan's backup cars. And that's why we have a yellow car with a white and red wing. Now, is there any consideration being given to possibly replacing the pop-off valve at this time? Well, that's still a big question mark right now. Again, uh, we stirred up uh, the swarm of bees when we went on and said it was illegal. We had that clarified that perhaps in some situations they could change it. But at this point, he is so far back, I think that's a far, far thing from the consideration once they get back in the competition. Yeah, he's been in the pits for 10 laps now. He's down in 13th position at this moment. So Rick Beer's chance of winning this 500-mile race are over. But Mario Andretti certainly is in a position to do so. Completed 140 laps, and we only got 60 more to go in this one. Now, the only other car on the lead lap with Andretti is Bobby Rahal, and he is about 47 seconds behind. Kevin Kogan is third, a lap down. Then in fourth is Pancho Carter, two laps down. And fifth is Jose Legarza, three laps to the rear. You might wonder why they'd want Rick Mears to stay in the car after losing about 10 laps, but of course, just exactly as Danny Sullivan said during his stop, only seven cars finished at Michigan. If Rick can go out, even though he is 10 laps down, he could still finish in the top 10, which is championship points, which may matter towards the end of the season when the final run in comes to see who becomes champion. Well, it's a little bit different look to the Pennzoil C7 March, the number one, because it has a white wing on the rear with Miller of it, but it's the substitute wing that will put Rick Mears back in this race and perhaps give him at least a top 10 finish in this event. Mario Andretti streaking down the main straightaway, continuing to run flawlessly in this 500-mile event. Mario Andretti started this race in third position, and as you can see, he has led 60 out of the 140 circuits. When something breaks on one of these race cars, like we saw happen with Rick Mears, what happens is the designers will now look at this piece again, find out why it didn't withstand the rigors of the racing here at Pocono, and redesign that part. So that part will never be back on Rick Mears' car again at a race such as Pocono, because it just didn't prove strong enough. Mario Andretti is coming back from a crash that he experienced in the Michigan 500 two weeks ago. He did not uh, suffer any injury in that accident, but he did hit the wall on the 69th lap and finished in 21st position. Now, that is a radar gun that's been set up by the escort people, and it gives us an indication of who is turning fast laps at the end of the straightaway. It's positioned right in front of us, but the radar gun is pointed down toward the first turn, and as cars come into its uh, range, it records the speed. As you can see, the top speed about 199 miles an hour at this point around 200 but uh, they have yeah I guess they have been showing speeds of an excess of 205 miles an hour in the last few laps to give you an idea of the difference between speeds obtained during racing conditions when there's possibly more fuel in the car and the driver makes a little bit more tired and the tires aren't quite as good racing speeds are slower 205 is the fastest we saw today but during qualifying we saw speeds up to 218 miles an hour. So qualifying, when you pull out just that extra little bit out of yourself in the car, that's the reason why it's just a little bit faster. 150.304, the average speed after 140 laps. So they're catching up with the record here of 156 miles an hour. And should we go the rest of the distance without any more yellows, we could possibly set a new record. It certainly did not appear as if we were going to in the early going, as we were slowed down. Uh,
different on this Lola. And here's another Lola, the Gallus Lola of Jeff Brabham, which uses the Honda engine. Now, this Honda has been very, very reliable for the Gallus team. But something has happened here. Brabham made it halfway down the pit lane and isn't able to get any further. So Brabham, who's at the end of the pit lane, is obviously in some sort of a trouble. Jeff, nine laps uh, off the pace, shown in 11th position, but his race may be over. Now, there is Jose Le Garza, who is going relatively slow down the uh, north straightaway. We anticipate his stopping for a pit stop this next time around. As we indicated, he came in last lap, but overshot the pit, and so makes another lap. Jeff was running in 11th position. And uh, Mario comes in. Trouble. Here's Mario coming in for a pit stop. The leader. We're on lap 145. He will not be able to go the rest of the distance without one more after this one. We'll watch the Newman, the Newman Haas crew go to work on this machine. Crew chief Bob Sproul and company changing the tires and filling the fuel. Bobby Ray Hall is in second position. He was 46 seconds behind Andretti when Mario came in for this stop, so we'll tighten up the distance, but Bobby will still need another pit stop. And there is Mario rolling out in a pretty good pit stop. 21 seconds, a little bit longer than normal because he did have a four-tire change. Now, I can only surmise that he may, be, he may want to keep this set of tires for the rest of the race, so the next stop, which he will need to finish this race, may only be for fuel. Now, if this set of tires are right, then he may have a little advantage over his rivals during the next pit stop. If he can just take on fuel and make a run to the flag, he will definitely get an advantage. Bobby Rahal. There. I'm not. We, we have a yellow light. Yellow flag is being displayed, and there is Jose Le Garza, who is going the wrong way on the racetrack. We presume a spin. This brings out our first caution flag since, not, since uh, the 55th lap. And it really works to Bobby Rahal's advantage because Mario Andretti had just come in for a stop under green. And now Bobby Rahal will be able to make a stop under yellow. And the field will close up. There is Bobby Rahal right there. Kevin Kogan is also in the pits and Rick Mears is also. Steve Horn in the Budweiser True Sports March team going to work on that car. They just have a three-tire stop. They didn't change that left front tire, so Rahal must be reasonably happy with that left front. So now this sets up a much better situation for us to, uh, to look at for the rest of this race. Now all three cars have stopped about the same time. They've all taken on fresh tires. So now it's going to be a three-car sprint from here to the end of this race. We'll tighten up the field because the pace car will come out line up behind the pace car 146 laps completed there is Mario Andretti out in turn number two and he is the first car behind the pace car while we're under yellow we'll take this break and be right back at Pocono back at Pocono International Raceway where 164 laps have been completed in the Domino's Pizza Pocono 500 the leader is Mario Andretti with a 7.9 second lead on Bobby Ray Hall. Still running in third position, a lap down is Kevin Kogan. Fourth, two laps down, Michael Andretti. Fifth, two laps down, Pancho Carter. Sixth is A.J. Foyt. Seventh, Raul Boisel. Eighth is Allenser Jr. Ninth, Jose Garza. And in tenth is Roberto Moreno. Moreno is in the pits at the moment. He has been in there for about a lap. It's more than just a routine stop, but Moreno last time was shown in 10th position. 10 laps down, 11th position is Sammy Swindell, 11 laps down. Moreno's car down off the jacks, and Roberto pulls back out onto the racetrack. I think you've got to really hand it to uh, Rick Gallus and the team. These three cars finished the 500-mile race at Michigan International a couple of weeks ago, and they're all three still running in this race. Uh, apart from the problem we saw with Jeff Rabham, where he momentarily had a clutch problem and stuck him at the end of the pit lane, he is now back in competition. But really, the Gallus cars at Michigan, particularly a uh, track that broke everybody's car almost, all three Gallus cars ran around reliably to the finish. And exactly the same thing is here today. So although they're not really on the pace, the mechanics are obviously doing a very good job screwing these cars together because they are, by far and away, the most reliable cars on the circuit. There is Mario Andretti continuing to lead and lengthening his lead, as a matter of fact. It's up to 9.9 .9 seconds now as he 
traverses the uh, north straightaway and approaches the Domino's Pizza car, number 30, driven by Al Unser, Jr. And Al Unser, Jr. now goes another lap down. That puts him five laps down to the field. Al with a lot of problems this week with his Lola. Is Gidley getting it to handle correctly? Lap. And uh, has never really uh, been competitive here during the afternoon, but he's still out there on the racetrack, nevertheless. Let's go down to Gary Lee. Well, of course, the race fans love to collect autographs from the race drivers, but some of the unsuspecting fans, if they'll look over my shoulder, they'll see right behind Mo Nunn with the headset on is Paul Newman, and right next to Paul Newman is Marsha Mason. Now, they're enjoying the race. Mo Nunn is working. He's the team manager for uh, Newman Haas Racing. He, lap after lap, is giving Mario his average speed and the interval between first and second. So some pretty interesting people watching this race here from the pit area and the uh, Newman Haas racing team. Mario, at the moment, is even on his numbers with his age and his number of race wins. He's 46 years of age, and he's had 46 race wins. I'm sure he'll be 47 next year, but he'd like to have win 47 before his birthday comes. And he is lengthening the leads now up to more than 10 seconds. So Mario is just now sort of biding his time. He is going to have to have another pit stop, we believe. Now, these are the type of signals that Gary Lee just spoke about that Mo Nunn will give to Mario. Every time he extends his lead, which is probably a couple of tenths of a second per lap, Mo Nunn gives that information to the pit board man. The pit board man, there we see it just there, L4. That means lap four, four laps left before Mario is due for his next pit stop. But as he extends his lead, they use these pit boards to constantly update Mario on not where he is, but where Bobby Rahal is in second position. Just to update you briefly on what occurred in the first uh, quarter of this race, we had numerous accidents. An accident on the very first lap in turn number two involved Scott Brayton, Johnny Parsons, and Dennis Firestone. Those three drivers, okay. Ed Pym was involved in an accident and suffered a broken right forearm. Johnny Rutherford involved in a tremendous head-on incident with the retaining wall and then hitting the inside guardrail but Johnny Rutherford climbed out of that car with no injury whatsoever now there's a sign again and it says three laps now before Mario comes in that's the only thing Mario will look for as he comes down this pit lane he wants to pick out his particular board and he will know his board above everything else because he's so used to picking it out there's his name across the top some people use a luminous strip of paper some people would use their sponsor's logo but that's the only the engine. 
and they're topping off the fuel. So we know that this will be the last routine stop. They had hoped to make it under the yellow, but they're right on the money with the stop. They changed the right side tires only. He is underway, and now we'll head down toward Bobby Ray Hall for his final stop. Mario Andretti blasting out of the pit area and goes back out on the racetrack. And now we'll watch Bobby Ray Hall to see when he chooses to come in for his final stop of the day. We're on lap number 173, 27 laps to go, and they should be able now to go the distance on the amount of fuel they have. It was very good for us to see the pit board um, over the last five laps. That's exactly the type of information that Mario and indeed every driver on the field will get every single lap. Now the radios do work, they can communicate and actually have a uh, chat about the handling of the car, but the pit board is always the, the Mr. Reliable. Whatever that says, the driver has to follow. Bobby Rahal on the long pond straightaway now is the leader of this race, but will have to stop before too long. March setting the car into turn number three. Let's see if he slows and comes into the pits. Yes, he does. Here comes Bobby Rahal in for his final stop of the afternoon. The crew is ready for him. He slows down and puts the car right on the marks, and the crew goes to work. While the crew changed the wheels or the tires and uh, put the fuel in, you can see Bobby gets a little fuel.
Bobby Rahal, who was challenging Mario Andretti for the win here at Pocono, has had a fire in the engine compartment and has now dropped several laps off the pace. But there is every indication that Bobby Rahal would very much like to get back in the race and have a respectable finish, if not a win. Seems to be strapping in right now. Gary, what's the situation? Well, I like this never-say-die attitude. He <laughs> rode back in the car behind the uh, tow truck. They pushed him in. He climbed out. They've taken an air hose to knock off all that powder from the uh, fire retardant. He climbed back in the car. Now, at some point, he'd taken off the cool hat, so he does not have that fire retardant Clavel on right now. They are strapping him back in. As you perhaps can see, the steering wheel, that uh, quick-off release steering wheel, is over there on the right tire. And indeed, he's going to try to go back out and race some more. Well, more power to you, Mr. Ray Hall. <laughs> you uh, are now shown in seventh position, four laps down, but that isn't all that bad. You can gain some valuable points. They continue to try to remove some of that powder from the fire extinguisher, creating quite a cloud of residue or whatever. Meanwhile, the race is about to resume while Ray Hall continues to sit in his car in the pit area. The pace car is off the track, and here we go with a restart. Now, here's the situation. Kevin Kogan is now on the lead lap. He was able to get back on the lead lap because of the pit stops. And you can see they come four abreast down the main straightaway here. There were eight cars between Andretti and Kogan when the green came out, and about a three-second difference. But Kevin will now try to close in on Ray Hall, or rather on Andretti, and make this a two-car battle to the finish. Mario will have a comfortable lead because of these eight cars that were between himself and Kogan. Now, there are such cars as Rick Mears, between uh, between Mario and Kevin, and Rick really, I don't think, will make it easy for anybody to pass him. So Mario will have it fairly comfortable for the next couple of laps, but Kevin must get through this traffic um, before he loses too many laps if, he, if he's to stand any chance of catching Mario to make a race out of this for the final win. There is Andretti. There are now still eight, now nine cars. Ten cars between uh, Andretti and Kogan. So Kogan has dropped back considerably here in that uh, one lap under green. Well, we saw he did change tires on that last run. There's Kevin going through turn one. He did fill it with fuel. And um, I, I can just hope that they put a good set of tires on this car because uh, the stagger differences can make such big changes on the car uh, on a, on a high-speed uh, super speedway. And if anything is amiss at all, uh, Kevin would not be comfortable with the car. Has to be the hard luck driver of 1986, in my estimation. He did win a race, of course, early in the season, but the 500 was so disappointing for him at Indianapolis. And Kogan, although running in second position here, apparently does not have what it takes to win this race. His best finisher at Pocono was in 1982. His first Pocono start, he was second. Last year, he qualified eighth, but a wheel-bearing failed on lap number 116, dropping him out of contention. This is Kevin's sixth season of IndyCar racing, and it also is his sixth different team. So really, from a, from a driver's point of view, to try and settle down with a team always just take, brings that little bit extra to what Bobby Rahal uh, vacate his car. Although he wanted to try and get back into the race, I think his day is over. But we were talking about Kevin Kogan. Six different teams in six different years. That's not a very good situation for a driver to be in. Because when a driver learns um, how to work with his mechanics, with his designers, with his engineers, um, it always, harmony tends to bring speed. And I think Ray Hall is a classic example of harmony bringing speed. He's been with the True Sports team for many seasons now. They know exactly how he works, and he knows how they work. And I think that's part of the reason why Ray Hall has been so successful over the last couple of seasons. Mario Andretti has a 14 and a half second lead now on Kevin Kogan, the only other driver on the lead lap with Andretti. And Mario, when he comes down this time, will click off lap number 185, and there will be 15 remaining in the Domino's Pizza 500 at Pocono. It's not a clear 14 and a half seconds either because there is at least still eight or nine cars between Mario and Kevin. So Kevin has his work cut out. He's not going to catch Mario if everything uh, just runs according to plan for Mario. Kevin is not going to catch him on the road. The only chance he has is another yellow flag. All right, Gary, here's uh, an interview with Bobby Rahal. Well, Bobby Rahal, the fire suit, did what it was 
was supposed to. Any indication what happened? Just a, a fuel spillage? I guess not. I guess the, uh, the top vent uh, stuck open. Because as soon as I left, I thought I could feel it, you know, on fire. Because it was starting to get warm where it usually doesn't get warm. And <laughs> <laughs> I got down one, I could see the smoke. Uh, well, I'm, then I was trying to find a fire truck. Couldn't find one, so I thought I'd get the hell out while I could. And uh, it's too bad, because uh, I don't think we could have caught Mario. He was, our car, the Budweiser car, never ran great all day, but it ran pretty decent. And I very well, we just hang in there and get a good second. But uh, that's such is life, I guess, huh? You're so articulate, so loquacious. You even had time in the cockpit to call your team manager and say, I'm on fire. Well, you know, I want them to know what's going on. It's not over till the fat lady sings, and we're a long way from that song, Bobby. That's for sure. Thank you. Well, Michael Andretti has come into the pit area, and there is a tremendous amount of smoke coming from that car. Michael got out okay, but Michael Andretti, who was running third, is out of the race. This puts Pancho Carter up into third place now, and the attrition rate continues. That's the end of a sad day for Michael because after his record-setting run, he was the only man in the starting grid to break the track record here. He set a pole position time of 205.7, but that was the only time he was to shine this weekend because from the start of this race, Michael has been in trouble. He did make some adjustments before the start of the race. They obviously haven't paid off properly. He had a very uncompetitive day, which will frustrate him enormously, and I think the blown engine is just almost what he expects to cap off such a day. There's Pancho Carter, who's in third. Our in-car camera has ceased to function. Nevertheless, it is a good run for Pancho Carter, now in third because of the demise of Michael Andretti. Pancho Carter has shown quite well in the last two races, both Michigan and here in Pocono. Gary has moved down now, and we'll talk with Michael Andretti. I have seen Michael before disappointed and frustrated, but right now you just look angry. I am a bit. You know, it's just, uh, we fought real hard all day, and then uh, to have the motor go with this, this shorter time left is just a shame. And obviously you kind of out-engineered yourself with a few changes before the race that didn't work. I don't think it was that. I think there's something wrong with the car somewhere, something ain't right. Well, obviously you can hear the emotion in the voice. This is one race the Andretti's want to win. Mario still has a very good shot at it. No question about that. Michael is out of the race, but now he can move to the pit wall and watch his father, Mario, uh, traverse the next 11 laps and possibly win this Pocono 500. Raul Boisel and A.J. Foyt are running right together on the racetrack. They are on the same lap, so this is a battle for fourth position. A good showing for Raul Boisel in car number 22. A.J. Foyt is sneaking up on him, and now perhaps A.J. will try to take over that fourth spot as they come down the straightaway. We'll watch him. A.J. moves to the inside and entering turn number one. Let's see who has that spot. It is going to be A.J. Foyt. Foyt moves into fourth position. Foyt now says that he's spending a lot more time with his IndyCar crew. He has made some changes. Um, he's kept some of the old reliable faces that he's had for years and years. But he says the biggest change that's making him more competitive this year is basically he himself is spending more time with the car and the crew. And I think this is by far his best showing um, this season. Michigan was, I think, the forerunner to him being competitive when he saw him wheel to wheel uh, dice with Tom Sneva. But now if he can finish in this fourth position here, I think it's his best IndyCar finish for uh, many seasons. down. Raul Boisel is fifth now. Into third position goes Pancho Carter. That's where he finished two weeks ago in the Michigan 500 and stands a good chance of repeating that here at Pocono. We'll be back with more of the Domino's Pizza 500 after these messages. 
to go in the Domino's Pizza 500 at Pocono. Mario Andretti is the leader. Kevin Kogan is in second. Pancho Carter third. A.J. Foyt fourth. And Raul Boisel is in fifth spot. There are 11 cars still on the racetrack in competition. Gary Bettenhausen has been our most recent retiree. He pulled off the track when the car lost power. So Gary will unofficially finish in 12th position. It appears is going to cruise to victory in this race if he can keep it together for another four laps. He's never managed to win here. There are many, many, many hometown fans here that have come to see him win here. Jeff Andretti, his son, gave us win number one for the family yesterday. Michael went out in the worst possible way. He was uncompetitive and then blew up. But Mario is going to make amends for the IndyCar fraternity at least. It looks. I mean, is going to have to go wrong with Mario's car. This is Kevin Kogan, who is running in second position. It's been a good weekend for the Machinist Union also. Their driver, Jose Le Garza, is in seventh position. Yesterday, the Machinist Union sponsored an ARS car and put Nick Bonoro Jr., the midget standout in the East Coast, in it. And Nick Bonoro Jr. just did a tremendous job in his first rear engine race on a super speedway. Battle with Fabrizio Barbaza for third place most of the event. Then Barbaza was involved in an accident here on the main straightaway under yellow. And Nick Bonoro Jr. went on to place third in that ARS car, race rather, in the car sponsored by the Machinist Union. So a decent weekend for that group of guys. Mario Andretti approaches turn number three. This will complete lap number 198, and he is about to lap Kevin Kogan. They run wheel to wheel down the straightaway. The uh, 198 lap is completed. The next time around, he'll get the white flag, indicating one more lap to go, and he puts a lap on Kevin Kogan. Bob, Mario is now so far ahead of the rest of the field that he can literally cruise from here on in. There is no way that he will run flat out to stress that engine or the car anymore at all. He can literally cruise because he's now got two laps from Kevin Kogan. So there's no need for Mario to do anything else for the rest of the race except just guide that vehicle around in the groove at probably seven tenths of the pace of the car capable of doing and he will take the checkered flag. It will be win number two for Mario Andretti in 1986. He also won at Portland earlier this year. The white flag is displayed by Nick Bonaro and one more circuit of this two and a half mile trioval and Mario Andretti will have the victory in his pocket. Mario came into this race in third place in the point standings with 75. His son Michael led the point standings with 88 and Danny Sullivan was second with 81. Mario can definitely make some headway in his quest for the PPG Cup for 1986. Mario Andretti now dives low into turn number two, the tunnel turn, brings the car out for the outside retaining wall as he heads down the 1,730-foot north straightaway. Andretti can coast to victory from here. He's off of corner number three, sets the car straight away down the long front stretch, and the checkered flag waves. Mario Andretti has won the Domino's Pizza 500 at Pocono. Kevin Kogan will unofficially finish in second position. Poncho Carter third. A.J. Foyt fourth. And Raul Boisel finishes unofficially in fifth. Mario, after all these years, wins Pocono, and he is congratulated with a wave from Kevin Kogan. Mario definitely has many, many fans in the grandstand here because I think... As far as we can see down here, everybody stood and cheered Mario as he took the checkered flag on that final lap. That's good news for the Lola camp also because there were a lot of the drivers and team managers and crew chiefs becoming a little bit disillusioned uh, with the Lola chassis because it has, in fairness, been off the pace. But they have made some changes to Mario's car and the performance here shows that they have made the moves in the right direction. Well, they came here with their Go Mario signs, and Mario did what he 
was told to do. He wins the Domino's Pizza 500, and we'll be right back. Andretti is in victory lane here at Pocono, having won the Domino's Pizza 500. Let's go to Gary Lee. Mario Andretti, congratulations. You told us earlier in the weekend how important this race was to you. It was the only real big one you hadn't won. Well, I'll tell you, I can't describe how important it is for us, for the team. It's the first race uh, on a super speed that was ever won on Goodyear radials, and the car just worked perfectly. I think uh, we were able to really set up the car on his radials, and um, I've had the car as consistent as I've ever had it all year. So I'll tell you, big thanks to Goodyear and my crew. Does this round out the racing career? Career by winning in your home state well I tell you what uh, it certainly does complete a good cycle and I tell you I can't tell you how happy I am because uh, it's been so important and this race has eluded me for so many years and my son Jeff started uh, the trend here with Saturday and then Michael said on Paul I tell you and ready family couldn't be happy well, you know it was an answer family championship last year you've just been handed the note to indicate you have I think 96 points and officially Mike has 92 well you know it's I think it's gonna be a good fight to the end and I'm very happy that uh, perseverance I think is working for us we were able to uh, to get this Lola working finally I mean a lot of people I think gave up hope on us but uh, we keep working and I have a, a team that uh, has an equal character I think and uh, we won with them before and I know we can win with them again big slap on the back from Jeff right back here who won yesterday there's dad and their son in victory lane <laughs> Well, last year it was a battle of the Unzers to the PPG Cup, and it could be a battle of the Andrettis this year. Our Winner's Circle interview has been brought to you by Goodyear Eagles. You either have Goodyear Eagles or you need them. Well, Gary and Derek and I will return to Pocono International Raceway for our final thoughts on this 500-mile race that's been won today by Mario Andretti. And finishers here at Pocono today. The winner, Mario Andretti. Second was Kevin Kogan. Third, Pancho Carter. Fourth, A.J. Foyt. And Raul Boisel was fifth. Finishing in sixth spot was Al Unzer Jr. Jose Le Garza was seventh. Eighth was Rick Mears. Ninth, Sammy Swindell. And Roberto Moreno finished tenth. The race summary showed the time of the race was three hours, 17 minutes, and 13 seconds. Average speed, 152.1. Johnny Rutherford's 1974 race record still stands. We had six leaders, 11 lead changes, seven caution periods and a total of 36 laps under the yellow. The unofficial updated point standings. Mario has now taken over the points lead with 96. Michael is second with 91. Sullivan and Allens are junior tied with 81. And Tom Sneva is fifth in the point standings with 70. I'm very glad to see Foyt finishing in the top uh, one of the top positions. What interested me more than anything else was Mario's remark about the Goodyear radials. Perhaps they may have helped the Lola more so than the March. So this may be one of the reasons why the Lola may be more competitive from here on in for the rest of the season. And so Auto Racing's Triple Crown is concluded for 1986. We had three different winners. Bobby Rahal at Indianapolis, Johnny Rutherford won the Michigan 500, and Mario Andretti won the Domino's Pizza 500 at Pocono here today. And this race has been brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Goodyear Eagles. You either have Goodyear Eagles or you need them. And by Pennzoil Motor Oil. Quality protection. Ask for it. Another auto racing doubleheader next weekend on Friday night from Bristol International Raceway in Tennessee. Qualifying for the Winston Cup race and a grand national event. That's on Friday night at 7.30. Then on Saturday night, it'll be the Winston Cup race from Bristol International Raceway. We thank you for joining us here this afternoon on behalf of Gary Lee, who worked the pit area, and Derek Daly. Our congratulations to Mario Andretti, the winner. For now, this is Bob Jenkins. So long, everyone.